Hi everyone, um, big build up there, hopefully I'll live up to it. Uh, so, so this session today is going to be um, SQL Server 2005 Integration Services Performance Considerations. I say performance considerations, I, I do do a one day course on performance and that doesn't even cover the, uh, cover the uh, we'll software the really performance. There's just so much that you can do with um, performance inside of integration. But what I'll do is I'll show you hopefully today some of the, they're not mistakes, but they're common things that you will do that suck. Yeah? They just, they will hurt you and you will, you just won't ever make it right. Yeah? So hopefully I'll teach even everybody about a little bit about some. Okay, so this is me. Uh, I'm a SQL Server MVP as well. There's a few of us knocking around. Um, so MVPs are people at Microsoft Award um, for, I don't know, helping out in the community, helping at conferences, speaking, all that type of stuff. And we get privileged to see the products really early so we can have an influence in its bill. So I'm one of the dubious um, authors on the first to press integration services books. This was by Rocks. It's actually under Wiley's banner, but Wiley bought part of Rocks. So it was under Rocks. I'm the second from the left, look as though I've escaped from a jail. Yeah, so it, it, they're not the best. But it's a good book. It's a good book. Um, if you're looking to learn a bit about integration services, certainly in 2005, that's not bad. I've been working with SQL Server 2005 at clients since 2002. Yeah. So I've seen it when it was really ugly. And I've seen it when it was ugly, and I've seen it when it's been um, cleaned up a lot. I worked with clients in 2008 as well, so I did part of the project Real Stuff. So if you know anything about that, it's where Microsoft took SQL Server 2005 to Barnes and Noble and others, and said break it, and they did. Okay, I'm not too sure how that well that comes out, but I've got two websites. So my two websites are around integration services and DTS, which was its foreign. Anybody use DTS? Lots of people prefer DTS to integration services as well. A lot of people get very annoyed when they use integration services having used DTS, but there's a good reason for everything. Okay, so SQLIS.com, SQLDTS.com. So if we've got articles up there and stuff for pretty much anybody and everybody. The is.com site tends to focus more, I guess, now on custom components because we can extend integration services so much better than you ever could with uh, DTS. We've got a number of um, custom components, and there's one that I use in a demo, so it's, it's um, is that rose. Okay, so this, this, this presentation then is broken down into two. First part's a little boring, but it's something that you've just got to do. Yeah? The first part is something that you have to do. It's not really interesting. Nobody wants to do it. It's like documentation. Yeah? Nobody wants to do it. You're always going to come to it right at the end of a project. You never do it. You leave the company, somebody else comes in, have no idea what you've written. Right? The first part, though, for integration services stuff is something that you have to do. Otherwise, all of your packages, all of your ETL solutions will suck. Yeah, they won't work. And then, by the time you get to the end, and you're trying to shove a billion rows a night into your data warehouse, and it doesn't work, you won't have time to go unpick your 40 odd packages that are doing it. Yeah, so do it and do it right first time. The second part is going to be where, in my experience, a lot of people go wrong. And it's a real easy fix for some things, like the OLEDB uh, command transform. Lots of people use it because it's lovely, it's simple, it'll hurt you. Yeah. So it's broken down into two. First bit's talky talky, second bit's a bit more visual. Okay, so the first thing that you've got to do is you've got to think about what you do before you build an integration services solution, before you build an ETL solution. What is it that you're trying to do? Yeah. How you, what, what is it that you've got to do? You've got to move data between A and B. You've got to download some FTP files. Yeah. Make a plan of what it is that you think you have to do before you start to do it. Don't just weird in there. 
So one of, the, one of the problems with Microsoft tools, right, is, and I don't think Oracle, Oracle can make tools. One of the problems with Microsoft tools is they're easy to get into. You can just crack open the box, start dragging and dropping, and away you go, and it moves data. Problem is, your packages at the end will be nonsensical, won't be doing things properly, you'll be bolting bits on, it'll be very organic. Yeah, and before you know where you are, you've got this spider's mess of a package that we think does what we want, but debugging is a nightmare. So just have a think about what it is that you're trying to do before you try and do it. How are you trying to do it? Although I love integration services deeply, doesn't mean I'm going to use it every single time to move data. If all I want to do is chain some stored procs together, which are going to move data between two tables within the same database, yeah, if that's all integration services is doing, why am I going to do that? Besides the workflow mechanism inside integration services, it gives you nothing, right? Except you've got the added overhead of firing up DT exec and executing your packages. Don't use it if you don't have to. Yeah? Where are you doing it? So there's some things that won't be available to you depending on where you are. So does everybody know about the SQL Server destination and in integration services? Okay, so that is electric quick. I mean that is quick on inserting data. However, I have probably worked with maybe 60, 70 clients on integration services. I've never seen it used once. Why? Because the problem is with the SQL Server destination is you have to be, the destination has to be on the same box as your ETL solution because it gets into bed with the memory space. Yeah, so it says, okay, what we're going to do is we're going to jump in here. SQL Server says, wonderful, let's go. And it is electric. However, I've never ever yet seen it used. Yeah, if you do use it, then that's fine. But what it does mean is that you're going to be taking resources away from your user chances. Are. So it becomes more like the same kind of performance hit that you get with ELT rather than ETL. Restarts. Restarts are a good thing in integration services. Don't see enough people using them. So restarts. Anybody use restarts? So you're doing quite well. <laughs> Okay, so it restarts your ability to not have to redo everything. So if you've got a big file that you suck, or a big amount of data that you suck every day from, I don't know, Australia or somewhere like that, and you crap out later on because you spelled product wrong in the, and update SQL step at the end, what you don't want to have to do is go to your logs in the morning and say, oh, crap, not spell that way. Change it. And then what you want to be able to do is just press the button, right, go with that package again. If you press go with that package again, all that data is going to come to Australia, from Australia. Right, which means you're going to be able to get a call from an irate DBA in Australia who's been woken up by his Blackberry saying, oh my God, the activity has gone through the roof on one of our trading systems. Yeah, and either that or they'll just VPN into their servers and say, look for it, kill, yeah, and your job will fail. So restarts allow us allow integration services to just say, tick, 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 okay, let's try that again. Try, done. Yeah, so massive performance, not performance as in moving data, but massive performance as in time. Identify your environmental restrictions. So LAN, if you're on a 56K dial-up, shoving 10 rows is gonna be painful, yeah? So understand where is it, where's the data that you're moving, where's it coming from, what kind of links do we have in place. Disks, um, lots of discussions around locally attached storage versus <coughs> SAN. My experience is SAN providers don't typically understand how SQL Server wants to access the disks. And if you go to sites like grumpydba.com or grumpyorddba.com, He's got lots of performance metrics of locally attached storage versus SAM. And locally attached wins hands down. CPU. CPU, again, number crunching is going to use CPUs. Understand 
how much you've got available to you. And integration services, one of the reasons it's so quick is memory. It does all of its transforms in memory. Yeah, so it just picks up the data, loads it into what I'll show you later, which are buffer structures, and does all of the transforms in memory. That's why it is so much quicker than DTS was. That's why there's so much scope for doing so much more as well, because you don't need to do it on a source to do the transformations. You can do it whilst it's in memory. Okay, so depending on what source you're coming from depends on how you're going to access it. So if you've got a flat file perhaps, maybe you're going to choose to use a flat file source adapter, but also look at bulk insert. Bulk insert, if all you want to do is just get it in as quick as possible, chances are it's going to be faster. Yeah? Look at your volume, your width times height. It's important when you're doing buffers and memory management. Don't do select star from. We had a, a couple of the sessions this morning about select star. It's dead easy to do, right? And you'll just deal with it when it gets there. Yeah, lazy equals really bad. And location of the source data again is everything local. Are you sucking across the web? Sucking across a 56k link or whatever. Okay, what type of operations are you trying to perform? Synchronous and asynchronous. I'm going to cover what synchronous and asynchronous are because they do affect performance massively. Yeah. Lots of people have heard of the phrases but never actually understood what happens when that happens. But they do affect you, it does affect you and it affects your packages badly. So you can also look at things like um, caching. So if you look at the lookup transform, what it does initially is it caches the reference data set. That means it reads it into memory. It does that before anything starts moving. If you just say, okay, select star from trade data table where time is between now and whenever we started, if that loads four billion rows into memory, it's going to, A, going to take a while, and B, you're not going to have any memory left to do anything else with. Sorting, if you can do sorting on the source, do it on the source. Don't do it inside integration services. Yeah, so there's a sort transform, don't do it in there. If your source provider provide, uh, provides the order of viability, do it there. You won't be able to use indexes. Once it's in SQL Server's memory space, you can't use indexes. Yeah. All you can do is just read it into a buffer, and it, in the sort transform, it's just a big fat array that you say sort, and it'll do a big sort. Again, it'll hurt you. And aggregations, exactly the same thing. We've got to read all of the data in to be able to aggregate it. Makes sense. If you can do the aggregation, do it on the source. You've got indexes on the source that are going to help you out. Yeah, so these are all things that you've just got to think about before you start drawing on your sources, your destinations, and your transformations. Okay, how are you going to deliver the data? We spoke about the SQL Server destination. So, like I said, I've never actually seen it used. It might work for you, but if you if you know that you're if you know that your um, destination is on the same server as your package that you're going to be using to do the inserts, use a SQL Server destination. Yeah. If not, you can't, because as soon as you push, if you develop locally and develop on the dev edition locally, you can use a SQL Server destination, absolutely fine. You'd be telling the, telling the guys who promote this stuff, yeah, I can, I can shift a billion rows in 25 seconds. Yeah, they shift it up to the server, where it's at more of a, a three-server architecture. So you've got your source, your middle layer, which is your ETL, and then you've got your destinations. It'll crap out. It'll just say, I can't do that. Yeah? So, like I said, I've never seen it used in anger. So chances are you'd be using the early DB destination. Parallel. I'll show you an example later on of how you think it's working in parallel, but really it isn't. So this is one of the big things about 2005, right? 
2005, you think things are acting in parallel, but they're not. They're just on a big, fat, one single thread. So 2008, a lot of those things have been fixed. So has anybody used a multicast transform? Yeah, you do. So I use that. Come on. I, really, I use that all the time just by taking one part out to stage just so I can get a screen. Yeah, and then one part still flows down the rest of my transforms where I wreck everything. Yeah, so I just do it screen, 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 and then I've got something to go back to. Yeah, that is all single threaded. Yeah, so you've got 50 outputs coming out of your multicast, all going to different destinations, perhaps. Yeah. They're all on the same thread. All it does is just fills them up round robin, round robin. Yeah. So what, what a lot of people think is they're all going in parallel. Just because you see them change, yeah, doesn't mean anything. It's all on a single thread. But 2008, that's all fixed, and each of them is able to go out and get an extra engine thread. Staging. So one of the reasons Microsoft changed DTS, well, one of the things that Microsoft tried to do when they changed from DTS to integration services was stop everybody just dumping data. Yeah, so everybody would do ELT rather than ETL, yeah? extraction, load, transform. So they just dump data, dump data to a SQL Server table, dump data to a flat file, dump data here, dump. And then before you know where you are, you've got all these data sets around that you'll never use again. You keep populating what's populating. So Microsoft did everything in memory. And this allows you to get rid of 99% of all stages. But don't think, don't spend a day, day and a half thinking of ways to do in things without staging, if staging is the right choice. I'm going to show you a solution later on where I could do it all with Microsoft Transforms without touching disk at all. And then I'll show you a way where I do go to disk, and I'll show you the difference between where I stop it because it's taking too long and five seconds. Yeah, over 5,000 rows. Yeah, just because staging is an ugly word, but it's not necessarily the wrong word. So you can stage. Indexes, triggers, relationships. Okay, when you're pumping into a table, who, when they're loading data, takes the indexes off? Okay. That wasn't quite what I expected to answer. <laughs> okay, so, so there's two schools of, well, there's a number of schools of thought, right? So if you've got, um, if you've got a, a, a table that's, that's empty with indexes on, yeah, just bulk it into a heap, take the indexes off, bulk all your data and apply the indexes afterwards, it makes sense. We've also got other tricks, so you've got partition switching as well. Bulk it into a, a temporary area, apply the indexes, switch. It's just a metadata operation, happens like that. Yeah? So just think about indexes, because they have to be updated, they're going to hurt every time that you have to update them. Right? And then batched inserts. So this is most do the OLADB transform, so you can perform an insert or an upsert or whatever it is that you want to do. But batched inserts, so you can get, so if you the problem is, if you're, if you're constantly pumping in, by default what the OLEDB destination will do is it will say, okay, give me every single row, I'll store this in a big fat memory structure, then squeeze it through. Which is fine if you've got a shed load of memory. However, what you might want to do is just do batched inserts. So take 10,000 rows, batch it up, pump it in, batch it up, pump it in. So your memory will, will do this, available to you. So you won't strangle yourself. Okay, so now we get on to the tuning part. Yeah, so I guess I've used 20 minutes, that's about right, I'm due to overrun. I've never yet come in on time for a presentation. However, I've tried to, I've tried to make this presentation the first one ever. Right, so I'm trying desperately to come in on time. I was telling Pavel that my worst was in, was in Australia. So Australia, they booked me for an hour and 10, hour and 10, I was telling you, wasn't I, Pavel? An hour and 10? And I overran to three and a half hours. <laughs> <laughs> so that, I'm actually quite embarrassed by that because that really is serious overrun, right? 
That's an important information, you know. Next time we we'll schedule you for the last session of the day. <laughs> <laughs> That's what people do, right? That's what people do. They put me on just before lunch so I can run into lunch and people can just disappear as I'm still talking. Oh, or at the end of the day, so people we'll, can just get we'll, up and go home. We'll schedule you for the last slot, but after two hours you have to start serving beer. Yeah. <laughs> 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 break up here. Yeah, that's just that bribe in the guards, they try to lock the rooms. Yeah, I'm actually quite embarrassed by that. I'm usually not that bad, right? Usually only 20 minutes, 10, 15, 20 minutes or over. Yeah. Okay, so this is what we're going to look at then. We're going to, these are the things that uh, we're going to look at next is um, table of view, right? This big performance hit, yeah, that you'll have, and that's on the OADB source adapter. Hopefully, all of you are going to tell me that you don't use this. But I dare say somebody's going to tell me that they do. Okay, we'll recap on how buffers work because what I want to keep it's reiterating is buffers are expensive to create and populate. We'll look at synchronous versus asynchronous and unused columns. So has anybody seen the warnings that you get in the progress window that says, look, if you're not going to use this column, get rid of it. It's a big yellow triangle. You must have seen it. Everybody has them, right? We're going to look at execution trees and plans. So execution trees and plans are going to help you with threading. They're going to help you to understand how many engine threads your pipeline, because that's what we're interested in, right? It's where speed comes in. The pipeline is where speed comes in. It's the only thing you're interested in. Yeah? So execution trees and plans help you to decide, okay, we're only using a single thread. I thought we might be using more. So execution trees are going to tell you how many you're using. And then we've got the OLADB uh, command transform, which is used by Microsoft in their slow change of dimension wizard. Yeah, it's used as one of the destinations there. Um, so it's useful. I, I do use it occasionally, but don't use it all the time. Just because it's nice and easy, don't use it all the time. Okay, OLADB source adapter property called access mode, right? So it's the second drop down that you get. If you look at the UI, who uses table or view? Come on. Come on. I know you do. Right. Okay, right, so it's really bad, right? So that is amazingly bad. So you should be using SQL command or SQL command from variable. SQL command from variable happens to be my favorite, and there's a reason for that. So SQL command from variable allows me using um, a property on the variable called evaluate as expression. I can build an expression for my variable to be a evaluation time by the other DB source adapter that gets executed. So the problem is with uh, things like parameters, as you're passing parameters, if you've got nested subqueries in your extraction routine and you bury in there parameters, maybe the question mark, which is the OLADB's um, parameter holder, yeah, it's not going to be able to figure out what the hell you mean. Yeah, it just won't get it. Whereas if you use a variable, it doesn't matter. You can catenate everything together. And all that happens is when you say, okay, pass that for me, it says, okay, Work out what the variable value is. Now give me that. Yeah, it just gives it to you in text. So you can pass anything you want. So going against Oracle, SQL Server, yeah, doesn't matter whether they accept parameters or not. They're not going to get them. They're just going to get a SQL statement. That's all they get. Yeah, massively flexible. Don't see it being used too often. Though. Evaluate as expression on a variable. Use it. Okay, so getting back to the original point, using SQL command or SQL command from variable, order of magnitude quicker, massively quicker. Why is it quicker? So the problem is with uh, table of views, it calls open row set. SQL command, on the other hand, calls SP prepare. Open row set, what the very first thing it does is it says, okay, what I'm going to do is I'm going to set your row count to 1. 
Now go give me the metadata for this one row of data that I'm going to retrieve. Okay, yeah, I've got that, got that, got that. Right, here we go. The only problem is, is open row sets just set your row count to one. That execution plan will be used by the source adapter when it runs. So obviously, if you've got quite a few more rows than one, that execution plan might not be the whole best thing on the planet, right? So you can use Profiler to tell you. Yeah, you can understand exactly what's happening with these source adapters using Profiler. Does everybody use Profiler? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so let's have a look at it then. Okay, I'll just switch to my other desktop. So table or view. Right, I'm not going to do anything particularly sexy with this. So it's a very, very massively um, simple package. But it's going to look like that. Yeah, so it's just going to say it's table or view from the data access mode. What I want to do is I want to crank up Profiler. Okay, I'm going to start with that. I'm just going to choose my event. Don't want to be Show my event. Then I'm going to go to performance and show plan XML. Okay, so we're running. So let's go ahead and just execute that task. There you go. Okay, so you can see it's set my row count to one, but where it's going to come in after it's done the select star from Doing a select star as well, right? It's this guy. So you've got your execution plan generated. <coughs> but unfortunately, the estimated number of rows is one. Well, that's right, because it's using the execution plan that the parsing gave it, and it's one. And that doesn't necessarily work very well. Okay, so let's see if we can't do a little better. Okay, so this is more or less exactly the same thing. We're still selecting from the same table. It's just that I've put the um, where clause in for order quantity greater than two. Again, why do I need to filter with inside uh, integration services when I can do it on the source? What if we had an index on order quantity that I could use and it retrieved the data so much better than reading it all in and saying, okay, right, you over there, you over there, yeah, do it on the source. Okay, so same idea though. <coughs> okay, so it calls SP prepare, which builds a statement up. It executes the first statement, unprepares it, but the thing that we're actually interested in is there. You can see it's a whole load different. Yeah, it's done a scan of the clustered index, which means that it's looked at all the 121,317 rows. Yeah, which the first one did as well, right? And we filtered it down to 30 or so. Yeah, but at least this one's got one built. I've got um, an execution plan built for the query that we're running. So just be aware that 
what you choose on the access mode property. Access mode, just set the table of views nice and easy, it's a select star from, you don't have to worry about what the hell does it mean if I want a SQL command, oh no, I've got to write a piece of SQL, yeah? Do it, yeah, just take the time, do it. Okay. Okay, buffers then. Buffers are what move your data around. Right, buffers are these pieces of memory in a certain shape that pick up your rows, you get shoveled into, it's like a, a, a wheelbarrow, right? You just shovel a load of rows into this wheelbarrow, it gets, gets pushed along and emptied out, hopefully, at some point, yeah? You'll have multiple buffers working at any one time, hopefully. I mean, you've got to seriously have no memory if you don't, yeah? But they're generally, unless you change the default properties, they're 10 megs in size. Yeah, Microsoft reckon they pretty much got it right. So you, chances are you would need to set that property, yeah? 10 megs. It's a real simple equation as to how many rows you're going to get in a buffer. How wide is your row? How big is the buffer? Do the division. That's how many rows you can fit in. Yeah, so obviously if you can only fit two rows in, it's going to take you a shed load of memory to get that down. So always keep it nice and tight. You can't add columns. Yeah, you can't change columns. You can't remove rows. You can't reorder in the same buffer profile. I'll show you what a buffer profile is. A package will have different buffer profiles as it moves through the pipeline. You cannot add columns. Okay, so there's, there's people in the audience now saying, but I can use a derived column transform or a data conversion transform, and it will add a new column to my pipeline. That's technically true. However, what happens is, as you're designing, you say, okay, what I'm going to do is I've got one called A, one called B that's coming in. I'm going to create one called C. Yeah, C is A divided by B. Yeah, so now I've got three. And now you're going to tell me, well, that's adding a column, isn't it? It's not, because what the pipeline does is it says, okay, he's going to want C. So what I'm going to do is this buffer profile, I'm going to have a C there already waiting for it. Yeah, so it doesn't create any as it goes through. It doesn't do this. It already starts out with this. It looks at the buffer profile and says, okay, he's going to need a row this wide. Then it does its sizing. Yeah, so if you don't need columns, don't use them. Okay, so this is ha basically how um, the data flow works, a bit of mechanics of the data flow. So you have one or more outputs on a component, and you'll always have an error output as well. And transformations are inputs and outputs. Depending on what transform you're using, depends on how many you've got coming in, got going out. And destinations, obviously, they've only got an input. They've got an error destination, an error output, but that's not an output output. Yeah, so you've got sources with only output, destinations only inputs, and transformations, inputs and outputs, varying amounts of both. Okay, so you're shoveling data through, they pass off rows between them. Okay, so buffer profiles. This is a very simple package. What we're going to do is we're going to take um, recent sales details, I'm going to aggregate it, and we're going to union it. We're going to take some archive data, add a column, um, check whether it's a new order or not. Yes, yeah, so we're going to do a conditional split. We'll multicast, generate two packs, two sources of the data. Remember, one of them I like to use on the multicast so that I can do an audit. So like a screen, I just dump to raw file or whatever, just so I can go back. When the manager comes in the following day and says, okay, where did that go? I can always say, okay, disappeared this screen. And then we're going to come down and dump it into SQL Server. So there's going to be many buffer profiles here, though. So this is the first buffer profile, so it keeps the same structure throughout all of these tasks. Yeah, so the multicast, see, just keep the same buffer profile. 
Same buffer profile equals same engine threads equals same threads on the operating system. We also start one, we start a new buffer profile. I haven't got that thingy over on the right hand side. That didn't mean anything to anybody, did it? Right. I've got this one, but that's not the one I think. I think I need that's walked out with it. I'd stop it. I think it's probably walked out with it. Right, so you've got another one over there. But then you're going to start another one over here as well. Yeah, so these are all generating buffers. These are where you're generating these buffers and putting them into the pipeline. But that buffer only lives to the aggregate transform. Then it goes to the union all transform. So you've got another buffer profile. Then you've got another, and then you've got another. All of these cost in performance to generate. So the definition of an AC, all of these buffer profiles get regenerated when you see an async component. Okay. Async components are where the input buffer does not match the output buffer. You have to do something. So for example, for a sort transform, for an aggregate transform, Chances are you're not going to have the same structure going out as coming in. Yeah? For a sort transform, you can't sort within the same buffer profile. So it has to hand it off to another profile which looks exactly the same, but with the sorted data. Okay, so this is the synchronous pipeline. So a buffer 1 gets generated, comes through to a transform. Buffer 2 gets generated, remember multiple buffers in the same pipeline. Buffer 1 reaches the destination, gets handed off back. So that's the way that's synchronous. If you had an all synchronous package, that's the way it would work. Nice and simple. However, remember, threading says that there'll only be one thread going through the whole path. Yes. Yeah, so it looks and smells different. Yeah, so you're gonna you're gonna order it. So what you're gonna do is you've got to create an exact replica of that data structure, take data coming in here, hand it off, put it into here. And then when this buffer's all finished, you can release that, but you've had to spend the time <laughs> generating this one. So yes. And Microsoft do that for you all in the async stuff. But if you're generating your own component, when well, you need to do that, you'll need to generate your output buffers yourself in prime output. Yeah? So you'll need to generate your output buffers to give to a process input to pass off. This is the way it works in an async component. So this is what we were just saying just now. So a buffer 1 will come in, buffer 2 is about to come in. Buffer 1 will get handed off to buffer 3. Buffer 3 will then move on. Buffer 1 will get returned. But what it means is, if buffer 1 is really fat, buffer 3 is nice and thin, means a change, right? Which means you're releasing more memory back, you're getting tighter, more memory, so it, it, it goes from this to this. So you've got a lot me less memory being in use coming down here. Yeah, so that's going to be a good thing though, right? What do you think? The problem isn't the size of the data. The problem's in the in the creation and, and filling of the other side. Because a buffer will only be able to hold so much. So it could be that buffer one can only hold, I don't know, 40 odd rows. It'll chuck into buffer three 40 odd rows. So it's a buffer for buffer. But it could be that that's, that's a third empty. Synchronous components use one buffer for the input, one buffer for the output. Asynchronous components use input and output buffers and they're different. Yeah. It is expensive to create and populate a buffer. If you don't need to do it, don't do it. Okay, so unused columns. 
So unused columns, do we keep them in or do we get rid of them? Microsoft in their transforms say get rid. Yeah? Their warnings tell you get rid of it if you're not going to use it. So what do we do? Do we leave them in? Do we get them out? So if in the pipeline, if you come in, because we can change buffer profile, it means if we introduce an async component, a union all for example, it means we can tighten it up because we can just get rid of the columns that we don't need further down. Yeah, so we can make that, that profile do this now. Yeah. Okay, so it should make everything a bit tidier. So do we leave them in, be a fat buffer, or do we introduce async components to tighten things up? You'd think that it was a no-brainer. Yeah, so the usual answer is that you think you know brainer to get the profile tighter so we can introduce more rows into these buffers and bring them down. But that's wrong. Yeah, it ain't. Initially when I started doing the testing on this, I was actually quite surprised that it, it wasn't nicer to get rid of them. You just leave them in. So let's have a look then. Okay, so what I've got in here is this is where I'm going to do the conversion. Yeah, so in this component, all I'm going to do is just generate some rows, and it's going to generate for me Unicode data. What this component does is it's an async component. No, sorry, this is a, a synchronous component, a data conversion transform. What it's going to do is it's going to make copies of those columns, but make them non-unicode. Yeah, so now I've got double the amount of columns that I had previously. Okay, so let's have a look. Let's just run that in. I think I've only got 100,000. Okay, so that's not too bad. I expect that to take about, yeah, 10 seconds. Okay, so then we've got the removal. So what this is, is this is just a, a very simple component that we wrote that just says, okay, for anything Unicode that you get in, make it a non-Unicode. So we create another buffer which looks exactly the same, except we convert from Unicode to non-Unicode. So you'll see that the metadata that comes through is Unicode, non-Unicode, yeah? This is where I'm removing it. I'm introducing an async component. Yeah? And the way you can do it is have a look at the output. Synchronous input ID is none. On a synchronous component, it will be the input. It will be the same ID as the input. Okay, so let's go ahead and execute that. So as you can see, it's just so much slower. Yeah. So our experience is, leave them in. You might get the warning, but there are warnings. And I think on the next slide, well, I'm not too sure how well that read. That's all right, actually. Okay, so what we did is we ran some controls and it's just over 100,000 rows. The control was just a simple shove the data in, uh, string data, just shove it in 10 more times, you get averaged over three runs. Same thing we did with the conversion, yeah? So we did the conversion where we get a fat buffer, and that obviously upped the time. But then what we did is we used the async component, we did the same text, so we made, so we made the buffer profile do this. 
Yeah. But now, if you look, we're just even slower still. Yeah. So that's our, I mean, this is over only over a hundred thousand row trivial package, right? Yeah. Our experience is, is you leave them in. Your mileage might vary. This is done on my PC. It's a contrived test. Yeah. However, you will get better times. Just those percentages might be different for you. Okay, so a transformation. So how are we doing for time? Maybe counting? Please tell me something to count. Okay, we've got 20 minutes. Oh, fantastic. Right, okay, so an execution tree. So, yeah, an integration services pipeline is broken down into execution trees, right? So execution trees are where your threads are generated. So each tree gets one thread. All trees, all operations that use the same buffer get the same tree, get the same thread. So like I was saying earlier, multicast transform, even though you have 50 outputs, they're filled round robin. Yeah, so what you see isn't necessarily what you get. They're just simple magic pointers back to the same piece of memory. Yeah. Now this is an interesting thing, I haven't tested it in the latest service pack. However, what used to happen in service pack two was you could change you could change the definition of something on one of the streams and it would be changed in the other streams as well. Yeah, which isn't what you want. So what a lot of a lot of people used to do is so they could start up more threads and get more throughput and separation. So they used to, they used to introduce an async component. So that union all, so we just have a union all of what? just union yourself and that'd be that. Um, but as you just said, with the AS, introducing the async component is it does hurt your performance. Okay, this is what an execution tree looks like. Has anybody seen execution trees? I think in that blog that I did, not a blog, that webcast that I did with some of you guys, I, I did go through a bit of uh, execution trees as well. But they're incredibly useful for you to understand what your package is actually doing, how many trees it's generating, how many threads it's generating. But they are incredibly useful. Thank you. Okay, so that's a very simple one. So you'll see that we've come in, generated is the name of the output, output on the generated, um, uh, I can't remember what the name of my own component, data generator. Yeah, I called an output generated. So that's the output, and you'll see that it goes into the multicast. It goes into, uh, it comes out on the output and goes into the trash. Yeah, and there's multicast output. Yeah, but all multicast is, is it just multicasts the same piece of memory. So you'll see we've only got one execution tree generated there. Whereas this one, things went a little different. Okay, so here, this pipeline looks as though it had two generators, data generators, the sources, and they went into the union all transform. Yeah, so they went into a union all which can take N inputs has one output, right? So that comes down there, then so we get execution tree zero and one there from the two generated. Yeah. They finish at the union all because the union all is now going to hand off those that data to another buffer. And we get another one on the union all output called execution tree two tree two. Execution tree two that pushes onto the input of the trash input. Yeah, so you can see here we're going to get three engine threads going, which is a nice thing, because if you've got a 16-way box, 32-way box, you might have this shoveling a shed load of data through an all-synchronous pipeline, and all you see is one of your processes is popping out the box, and the other 15 are playing cards, yeah, because they're not doing anything.
Okay, so you'll also see in the plan, you'll see work threads and source threads. So not only does your, uh, the pipeline generate threads, some components as well will generate threads internally so that they can do their work. Okay, so let's just have a little look at this. Um, the thing about execution trees is is there a log event, right? So if you go to logging, you'll see pipeline execution plan, pipeline execution trees. Now what I don't want to do, I don't want to do this old SQL Server 2000 rubbish, yeah, where I think, oh, right, I'm going to stage that data, and I've got to go look for the damn thing, yeah? So what you do is you look at this window called log events. So it should be under SSIS log events. And it'll give you it without having to stage this log file of what it is that you've got. Yeah, so if we go ahead and execute this package. Thank you. Are you trying to tell me that I'm drinking a lot? <laughs> okay, so you'll see that you get these plans generated, yeah? So it's all in the log events. So you don't need to stage this stuff and then go and open it up with something else, like no pad or word pad or whatever. And you can simply just double click on it. Yeah, so you can see it very nicely, very interactively. And you'll see for that one, for instance, we've only got one execution tree. Because everything's synchronous. Yeah, so we've just come, simple data generator, a thousand rows, and then two trash destinations. So look at the more complicated one. So here you've got two data generator sources into a single union all, and then into the trash destination. So what we should see is we should see this generator tree, this one, and this one, and it'll come down to this. So we should see three. So we should end up with uh, execution tree two. Here's another thing that I'm going to allude to. Uh, I'm going to allude to later on, right? But I'll show you it here because this is the uh, this is I've got the logger up. Right? Is if you've asked the pipeline to put 10,000 rows into the buffer and you say it's a 10 meg buffer, and then SQL integration services does the maths and says, well that doesn't fit. What it does is integration services fires a tuning event and says, okay, let's rack it down. Let's put as many as we can into there. So 7,801 is the amount of rows that would go into that buffer because we're too fat. Yeah. Okay, so let's get, I'm not actually interested in that. Then you've got execution trees. So there you go. So you get three trees generated, not one and two. So in themselves, but they don't alter what your package does, but they do tell you what your package is thinking underneath. It does tell you that you're going to get three engine threads there. Yeah, so this is three times that the, that the pipeline has to generate new types of buffers. There's three buffer profiles, three trees. So that's a new buffer profile it has to create, populate, create, populate. Okay, OLEDB transforms is nearly the last bit. OLEDB transform, who uses it? Do we like it? It depends on the performance. Who does one thing, that's 
crap. No. It, it, I, I use it. I use it, but it's, it, I think you've got to use it very, very sparingly. Okay, so it's super easy to use. Yeah. Interface is awful. Yeah, interface is absolutely awful. So if you're going to have the, if you're going to, if you're going to use it, so you can type in for the command. You can type in for the command update x set column equal to question mark column equal to question mark column. Equal to question mark. But then what you'll get on the mappings section is param zero, param one, param two. What I'd advise is if you're going to use it and you don't want to drive yourself nuts remembering what order your parameters are, use a stored proc because it will get the metadata from the stored proc and the parameter names will be the parameter names from the stored proc. Yeah. Okay, so interface is a little crap but it allows you to do inserts, updates and deletes and that's why it's super useful. And like I said, Microsoft use it, um, Microsoft use it with their slowly changing dimension transform. Yeah, so it does have its uses, it just it will hurt you. Okay, so what it does is it operates, why has it gone dark? It operates on a row by row basis. So it performs whatever operation you told it to for every single row. Yeah, it doesn't batch them up, it does for every single row. If you've got a million rows come past, it's going to do a million things. And like we said, it could be a big performance no no. Consider staging the data. Remember, staging, just because you shouldn't do it at every opportunity, doesn't mean that you shouldn't do it when it's correct. And a lot of the time, when, you, when an OLEDB transform is what you want to do, staging will probably be better. Perform set-based operations on your data. Set-based operations are generally better. Not always, but generally. And experience says that scalability will only work this way. As your data ramps up, scalability will only happen if you do this staging. Okay, so let's have a look at it then. Okay, so I've got a very simple uh, package. I'm just going to generate some data. And then I'm going to update a table. Yeah, so that's got a, a number of rows and it might have a million rows in it, something like that. And we're just going to update these. Then I've got my mappings. So I remember, because I haven't used store proc, it says param zero, param one, param two. So it's not a very useful interface. So let's just crank up um, profiler again and see what actually happens. Okay, so let's just execute this task. Okay, so there's only 5,000 rows. So I've managed to fit 5,000 rows into the buffer. Yeah, that's absolutely fine. But then what you'll see is it's doing this. Now that is seriously going to take me a long time. Yeah, so it's already taken far too long. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop the trace for a start. Now I'm going to work out doing it some other way. And this is my way, I've got a staging table. I'm going to truncate it at the start. And all I'm going to do is I'm going to pump through the rows that I want to update into a staging table. The packages that you create will be a little bit bigger than this. But this is essentially the results of working out what rows do I need to update or delete, yeah? These are the results of that. I'm just cutting to the chase, yeah? We get there and we're going to dump it into a staging table. After that, we simply issue 
<coughs> a set base update joining on the key columns for the columns <coughs> to nice and simple, right? So let's see what happens. There you go, it's gone. Miles, miles quicker. Yeah, so if you if you're thinking of using the OLEDB transform, think about doing this. Yes, you've got to generate a staging table, which means you've got something hanging about that's quite transient in data. It doesn't matter, yeah, because you'll thank yourself for it when your nightly loads finish. Whereas if you've got 50,000 rows coming through the OLEDB transform, and it's not just a simple update like that, you've got some wild and wacky process that you're going to run, yeah. this will be much, 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 much quicker. Okay, so this, this is the results of my testing. So you'll see that the OLEDB trans command transform holds its own for a while. Right, it holds it up until about a thousand rows. Yeah, this is on my laptop, right? Holds it up to about a thousand rows, but then as we move out, it just goes vertical. Yeah, I mean that really will hurt. Again, your mileage will vary. Okay, data correlation, right, just a couple of tips. Data correlation, matching data between A and B. Two choices, lookup transform or a merge join. Why? The problem is with the lookup for me is that it caches all the data before your pipeline starts up, right? It means jack starts happening. Nothing happens. Yeah, you're waiting. Then it goes. The thing about merge join is it doesn't care. What you do is just sort the inputs, matches based on keys. Once the keys change, it flushes. Keys change, flush. Keys change, flush. Yeah, so you always... <laughs> flushes, 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 right? That for me is miles better, but... Avoid delay to... Yeah, that's why. What you don't want to happen is that one of your sources hits the merge join around five minutes or greater than the other one. Yeah, stay to data if that's going to happen. Because what happens is the lookup transform, the merge join transform, by design, pushes back. Yeah, it says, look, we're not having this, and it won't move. It, you can wait all night, and I did. Yeah, and it doesn't move. Thank you. Okay, so here's some buffer figures. Like we said, buffer size tuning. Avoid many small buffers because it costs money to generate these buffers. Not cost money, cost effort to generate these buffers. Buffer size tuning tells you whether it's managed to fit them all in. Okay, parallel load then, last, last thing, parallel load. How's this doing? I get to use my little pointer. Okay, so, so the thing is, that's a single one, but then this guy will generate four different buffers. So we're loading those four. Yeah? But this guy's going to be the bottleneck, right? Because we're only sucking once. Okay, so that's fantastic. So you think, right, sorry, well, the odds are multicast data, and no, where we go. Yeah, unfortunately this to these is exactly the same as the previous slide. Because this guy doesn't give you anything, he just says round robin right, fail, 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 and then gives you four. So that, that is exactly the same as the previous one. This 
this is the only true way that you're going to do it. Yeah. You partition your data, so maybe if you're loading a week's load of data, I don't know. Say if you're loading, you do an end of week loads, partition your data source up into seven amounts. So you've got seven pipelines, you're sucking in seven lots of data. Yeah, but it means in the same data flow, or I do it in different data flows, means you can get seven threads going all at the same time. Yeah? Just partition it up and start sucking that data. Yeah, the SQL Server at the other end will be able to handle you shoveling that data in. And if it isn't, you then start looking at, okay, why can't why can I shovel data faster than the SQL Server can handle it? Or Oracle, chances are you're gonna have more performance issues with Oracle than you are SQL Server. Raw file, who uses it? Good, good. Right, for those that don't use it, naughty. Right, the raw file is if you're going to stage data because you want to use it at some other point in time, use the raw file. It's not readable by anything other than SQL Server, yeah, by integration services. Yeah. But what it does is SQL Server just dumps the data. It doesn't do any translations, just dumps the data. When it reads it, it's already in the format that it wants, so it doesn't have to do any translation. It just picks it up, loads it all in. If you're going to stage data, stage it with the raw file. Yeah, that's what it's there for. And you can also use it as a screen for later on. Yeah? So when you, like I said, when your manager comes to you and says, where did you lose that data? You can get these uh, raw files and look at them through a, a, a data viewer and see exactly where it is you lost them. Okay, we didn't cover anything about partition switching, contention, so scheduler contention, disk contention, networks, all that kind of thing. It wasn't really, because we could have gone on forever and a day. Right? Okay, questions, I have, I've run out of time, however, um, what I'll do is I'll make these slides available to Pavel to put up wherever they're going to go. What I'll do is I'll also include my email address. I don't mind taking emails, yeah, as long as it's not constant. <laughs> I don't mind taking emails and asking any questions you've got around performance and integration services. Yeah. So thank you and um, thank you.